Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, we appreciate all of your interactions and comments concerning this series. Uh, it's fascinating indeed. And keep those comments coming, keep your questions coming, and hopefully you've been able to share many of these videos, if not even the entire series, hopefully, with your friends and especially your Muslim friends. Today we're going to talk about how the Hafs can canonization uh, was chosen or how the Hafs reading that became uh, basically the standard reading for the so-called 1924 Cairo edition uh, was chosen. With me here, of course, to uh, answer that question is Dr. J. Smith. Uh, Dr. J, thank you so much, as always, for being here. So good to be with you. Thank you um, so much for having me. So, you know, really, I mean, w why was this particular reading, in light of what we shared last episode about his reputation, wasn't uh, so golden or glorious, actually? I think in an awful lot of t instances with, with Islam, they, didn't do, they do not look at their own history. They do not go back to last past traditions. We're going to see this specifically in this episode. This episode really brings us out. A, they seem to have chosen Huffs for another reason. Now, let's get some background to this. We do know, uh, we, uh, uh, Gabriel said Reynolds talks about this. Also, Angela, An Angelica Neuwirth uh, and Nicholas Sinai, they go and they give the history of how the Huffs was chosen, and they go back to 1924. Now, remember, the Ottoman Empire still existed up until 1924, so the Ottoman Empire were the ones that controlled the Muslim world. But they're in Egypt. In Cairo, especially, they were having problems. And remember, this was under the British protectorate at that time. But the British did not control Islam. And I, I know a lot of Muslims have come back to me and said, you don't know what you're talking about because the British were in charge of Cairo. That's true, politically speaking, but not religiously. And the religious context versus the politics were two different categories. So here in Cairo, they were having a problem. Because uh, according to what uh, Reynolds says and New Earth and also Sinai, the educational authorities were putting standardized tests in the high school uh, there in Cairo, just the city of Cairo, and they were coming up with many different answers uh, whenever they talked about the Quran. And of course, they wanted to have standardized tests. What are you going to do when you have a multiplicity, in this case, 30 different answers when they ask for a certain verse and for them to recite a certain verse? So they went to the Al-Azhar University, which right. is the, considered to be the greatest university, uh, theologically speaking, not uh, certainly not scholastically speaking, but theologically speaking in the Muslim world. And they went to a man whose name was Muhammad ibn Ali al husseini al-Haddad. Uh, who was one of the teachers there, and they asked him, could you choose one of these 30? At that time, there were 30 official ones. They were getting 30 different answers from all these students. And so he was the one that had a committee, but he was the one that came up with the answer, and he was the one that chose Huffs. Now, why did he chose Huff, choose Huff? Well, it looks pretty clear because the Ottomans considered Huffs to be the authoritative one. And the Ottomans, who were still in power, at least theologically speaking, though they were not in control of Egypt, they were, theologically speaking, they were the ones that had always had Huffs at the beginning. So he chose Huffs, which was standardized, we became the standard text for all of the schools in just one city, Cairo. So what did they do with the other 29? They grabbed them all up, accumulated them all, took them out into a boat, and threw them into the Nile the Nile River, thinking that that would solve the problem. You know, they've thrown them out. Just like Uthman thought. Yeah, Uthman just burned them, thinking that that would solve the problem. As far as the different dialects, you want to get back to one dialect. You want to get back to, in this case, the Kufan dialect. Uthman want to get back to the Qureshi dialect. Now they're getting back to the Kufan dialect, getting rid of all the others, including many of the Qureshi Qurans. Right. So with this happening in 1924, this was very successful. Uh, now, I want to just we'll go up and I want to show you a picture. If you go up to our slide here, just take a look at the slide there of Hattun's 37. Uh, she not only has 30, she has 37. We've shown this in another episode earlier. There are more than just 30. And these she got in the last six years. By thro dumping them in the Nile didn't do much good, did it? Absolutely if not. If Hattun can, introduce, can uh, buy these up in just a period of one to two years, I want you to come back to our desk here. Just take a look at these seven that I have here. In fact, I have eight there. Look at these eight that I have. I just got these in the last two weeks. You can buy them on the online. You can go to Al-Quran, 
uh, com, alcoranonline.com, excuse me. And by the way, you just bought some yesterday, didn't you? And this morning. I, I bought them before everybody jumped on uh, online to buy them because they're going to be out of stock pretty soon. They're going to be out of stock very soon <laughs> because we're pushing this and we're making this public for everybody to do so. I'm going to go back to the slide again. I want to show you Bernie Powers. There's Bernie Powers. He's got 23 and he's taken a while to find those. Uh, those you can get, again, he got his some online, but most of them he got by going and actually physically getting them. If you look at them carefully, you'll see there's notes all the way through them. See the different color notes? Because he is using these, he's working through them, and he's looking at all the differences. I wish Muslims would have done what he's doing. So he is actually, these are working copies for him. Uh, more so, uh, I mean, I have a huge admiration for people like Hatun and her team and Bernie Powers and his team because they're actually doing the work that Muslims should have been doing for the last 1,300 years. They're doing it in the last six years. I want to show you this slide here. Here's a slide that Hutton put together. I talked about this earlier. She uh, looked at all the different differences, and that's just what her team has come up with. 93,000 differences that she has found with those other 29 when compared to Huff's, the one that's circled in black. But Huff's, the Huff's one, is not alone. Take a look at these here. There's seven different Huff's. Each one of those that you see in that picture is a Huff's Quran, a Huff's Kirat. So even the Huffs, we're not even sure which one is the one that he wrote because we don't have the original manuscript from 796. Yeah, and, and there is a gentleman by the name Adrian Brock, uh, Brockett. Uh, 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 I think it's, it's Adrian Brockett. Uh, and um, he did his uh, dissertation back in the 70s about the different Huffs traditions, actually. And I think he came up with, uh, I would say, five at least. He came up with four, actually. Or four. I think yeah. it was four. Yeah. But the fact that Hutton has been able to find seven different ones with her team shows that even he didn't even know how many there are. Now, this was, he was chosen in 1924 for just the city of Cairo. And I have to keep reminding Muslims that just for one city. But became, that became so successful because now all the standardized tests were all giving the same answers. So in 1936, and there were some, I have to be careful because we do know that there were some changes even to the Hus between 1924 and 1936. But in 1936, the Egyptian government, seeing how successful this had been for the city of Cairo, decided to make the Hus text standard for all of Egypt. Right. Now it's the year that King Farouk came to power, so they named it the Farouk edition. W and it was a little bit different oh, the than the 1930s. That. 1930s, he came to, yeah. Yep. And so that they named it after him. So yep. that was now only for this country of Egypt, 1936. In 1985, then, in 1985, King Fahd, uh, who came to power in 1982, uh, he. Uh, decided in 1985 that the, looking and seeing that the, uh, the Egyptian model was so successful, uh, what they did in Cairo was so successful, he said, well, let's do the same thing. So he went to his scholars and said, I want you to name the Huff's text to be the official text. 1985, we're talking about uh, what we're talking about 35 years ago. Now, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Wait a minute, I've got a problem here. Let's back up, let's back up. Let's put them up on the screen, man. Go back up on the screen. We need a backup. Remember, we talked about we talked about Al Buhari, Volume Six, Hadith Number Five O Nine and Five Ten. Listen, there you see them on the screen. We've talked about this before, especially Hadith Number Five Ten. Right. Remember Al Buhari when he talks about how the Quran is put together. Remember uh, that scenario where we looked and we saw that Hudaifa comes down from Azerbaijan and he's upset because he's heard about all these other different variants. He's heard about these other, and he's re listened to other derivations of the Quran and they are different dialects. And he says, we've got to make one Quran. Uh, he comes back and he insists that Uthman write just one Quran and it must be the Qureshi Quran. Remember all this? It's right there on the screen. You can see it in the Arabic on the right. And there you can see the English translation. I'm just kind of summarizing it. We've gone through this before, didn't we? Remember Uthman did that? And then he created that one Quran and then he burned all the others. And what were the ones he burned? Well, he burned the ones from Basra and from Kufa and from Damascus. He burned them, why? Because those were the corrupted Qurans. Those were the corrupted dialects. Those were the ones that were not the one Quran. And he retained only the Qurayshi dialect, right? So where was the corrupted Qurans from? 
let's remind ourselves. Let's go back and let's look at this timeline. Remember, we talked about the five cities, one, two, three, four, five. We have Mecca, Medina, and it's going so fast, I can't even keep up with it. We have Basa, Kufa, and we then have Damascus. But hold on a minute, they were all, they were in black. We took the black away and we introduced the green again. Why? Because right. now you have the Quraysh, you have the Quraysh text that is now in all of the five cities, the major five cities. Remember we talked about this, this is all review. So by 652, we now have all of the major cities, both in Iraq and in Syria, are now Qureshi. That was hugely important. Or at least that's the thought. That's the thought. Right. And then we came up suddenly with these other Ubay ibn Qab's Quran, which then corrupted it again. And, and then you have Ibn Masud's Quran, and then you have Ibn Musa's Quran. And Zaid ibn Thabit, who we thought was corrupted, was back to the Qureshi. So now, really, we then come across this real problem because then in the late 7th century, you have three other Qurans. They don't even have the same surahs. One, uh, Ubay ibn Qab's has 116 surahs. Ibn Masud has 110, possibly 111 surahs. And Ibn Musa, though he has 114, his is not the same Quran that you have from Zaid ibn Thabit's that's there meeting. Uh, Mecca. So even at the end of the 7th century, we're now getting through some corruptions here. Yeah, you have Basra, Kufa, Damascus. Basra, Kufa, and Damascus, which are up at the top. Okay. So that we talked about, and uh, we said that these are the corrupted Qurans. Those, that's why we have them in red. However, here is the conundrum. Amongst these um, 10 readers, these are the 10 readers that we've always talked about, how many of them are Qureshi? Shwishi? Well, let's look and see how many of them Qureshi. Nafi, Ibn Kathir. Hold on a minute. Those three, well, I've gone too fast. Those three, Nafi, Ibn Kathir, and Abu Jafar are the only Qureshi ones. So out of the 10 readers, we only find three of them that are Meccan and Medinan. Right. How about the Rawis that come after. Remember we have 20 Rawis? How many of them are Qureshi? Well, we know that Kalun is Qureshi. We know that uh, Al-Bazi is Qureshi. We know that Kunbul would Qureshi. And we know that Issa ibn Wardan is Qureshi and ibn Jumaz. So, how <laughs> funny, this is a problem because if these are all corrupted, uh, they're up in the north, how many of the 10 are the uncorrupted ones. Let's go back to the slide again. Right. And let's ask this question. So how many of the 10 readers, remember the 10 readers, there was the green uh, seven and then the, the red three, used the Qureshi dialect. Let's just go through each one of them. Well, you have Nafi from Medina. You also have Ibn Kathir. They are, he is from Mecca. So he would be Qureshi. And then back down here, you have Abu Jafar from Medina. So those are the three, which means only three of the 10 readers were Qureshi. Only three of the 10 readers were Qureshi. What about the, the transmitters? Remember the transmitters in right. purple there? How many of them would be Qureshi? Well, you would have Kalun, he would be Qureshi, not Warsh, not Warsh. And then you would have Al-Bazi would be Qureshi. Al -Bazi, yeah. And then you have Kunbul would be Qureshi. You would have also Isa ibn Wardan would be Qureshi. I'm circling them in green and Ibn Jumas, which means only five out of the 20 are Qureshi. All told us, thus of the 30 official Qira'at, only eight used the Qureshi dialect. Only eight. 22 of them were not Qureshi. So Uthman's project failed miserably. And look at Hafs, circled right. in black. He is not Qureshi. He is from Kufa. He is from the stable of Asim. What's more, his dialect from Kufa was one which Uthman burned. So. Which many even accused of being un, uh, untrustworthy, you know, a liar, confused, he did liar. not have to, he tra created narrations where he wanted to, Invented, he tried to make yeah. his stronger right. than it should have been. That's right. So can you see, he is not only the wrong person, he is also from the wrong place, the wrong city, he is also from the wrong dialect, the corrupted dialect. And more than that, the only reason he was chosen was because the Ottomans had chosen him. And the only reason we can think of that anybody's come up why the Ottomans have chosen is because he's the easiest to understand. Why wouldn't they choose Ibn Kathir from Mecca? Why wouldn't they choose Nafa from Medina? Here's the, and this is the one that I really have a problem with. Why in the world did King Fahd choose a Kufan? 
when King Fahd, of all people from Saudi Arabia, should have chosen one of his own dialects. For heaven's sakes, he had eight to choose from, three of them from the readers. Why, whoever was uh, giving him his, uh, giving him his, uh, well, was telling him which ones to look at, what they were doing, and uh, uh, contexting, looking into the background, they should have at least have gone to the Qureshi dialect. They should have been the first to have said, we want a Qureshi. We want a Medina. We want a Meccan. We yeah. want Ibn Kathir or Nafi or at least Abu Jafar. Well, in defense of King Fahad, he would have relied on the advice of the religious authority. And the religious authorities should have known their own traditions. Right. They should have been aware of what we are aware of. And they should have known that you do not go to Kufa. You do not go to Basra. You do not go to Damascus. Listen, if Uth they weren't good enough for Uthman, then why are they good enough for King Fahd? Proving that King Fahd was not very religiously adept. It looks like the Saudi Arabians, that would have been a coup for them to go back to one of their own dialects. And yet they chose a dialect that was corrupted hundreds of miles away. And in this case, at least 100 years too late. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, the issue is really religious more so than anything else. And that's why it's uh, uh, crucial and important, by the way, for us to uh, pinpoint to these graphs and to show that at the end of the day, what we are dealing with here is the souls and the lives of people, and in this case, the eternal life of people. And my advice to our Muslim friends to do your homework I think we've given you enough information and data. All you have to do now, your homework, is to verify if what we're saying is true. That's all we're asking you to do. We're giving you even this challenge on our behalf. Please go and verify if what we're telling you is true. You do it yourself. Don't rely on so-and-so to tell you, by the way. They ain't going to tell you anything that is going to be helpful. You do it yourself, and you will be amazingly surprised to discover that what we're sharing with you is just no knowledge that nobody wants you to know. That's the sad reality. Next time, I guess we are going to give a conclusion. We're going to conclude and we're going to actually bring it all together. And we're going to ask some disturbing questions because these need to be asked. These need to be brought to the forefront. They need to be brought into the public sphere. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. And uh, until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International. Also, click on the bell so that you can receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or we go live. And I would like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking on the link right below. And that way you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you on how you can give to our channel. So thank you from the bottom of my heart.